week's episode will be a little different than our previous ones. Same women, same F-bombs, same honest conversation. For those who don't know, this week is National Suicide Prevention Week. Listen in as Jessica, yep, that's me, talks candidly about the loss of her father to suicide in an effort to highlight the importance of a topic that she holds near and dear to her heart and is the driving force behind the work she does today. Hi, friend. Hi, friend. How are you doing? You know what? I'm doing I'm doing well. This week, it's a little different than we have done, but it's important. So thank you for letting me do this. I'm already getting choked up. I know. I'm, I'm getting choked up. We haven't even started. I'm like getting teary. I'm getting teary because I've been thinking about you all week. I know how openly you talk about your story to some extent in your work. Mm-hmm. And I also know it's really a very intimate and sacred thing to talk about it in this way for this amount of time. So I'm I'm really honored that you do that here and honored that you do that with me and with our listeners. And I'm almost, I'm also like kind of a little nervous and a little protective for you. Like, I wonder what this is going to be like for you. You know, it is something I talk about a lot, but in the safety of my office, Mm -hmm. right? So in closed doors, I see people, I specialize in traumatic loss, So I often walk along others who have lost somebody tragically and am open about having a shared experience. Mm -hmm. I haven't really ever talked about it live. Yeah. And, you know, even going into this episode, it was, oh, yeah, okay, I just tell my story. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. And then it dawned on me that I haven't really talked about it live. It's always been in a publication or Mm -hmm. written Or I've highlighted it before a training I've given or a speech, but not really dove into my experience. It's really different to speak about something than to speak from it. It's really different to be showing up as professional Jess and um, as personal Jess. And so, yes, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And even though I've come, come really far in my grief journey, I lost my dad in 2011, so it's been a good chunk of time. But every time I talk about it or share anything related to this experience, I always get choked up. It never fails. And it's really, honestly, more a reminder that he's not here that hurts the most. The story itself is a hard one, but truly it's the everyday So when I start to talk about him and this loss, I'm kind of just forced to think about how much has happened since he left. Yeah. And how much pain there still is. Yeah. I feel like this is a weird thing about grief. I mean, it truly like shapes you every day, you know, but we don't always, it's not like we stop and talk about it every day. Mm -mm. His loss is here every day. Your work is centered. Your your life is centered around this loss and coming alongside people who are experiencing something similar to what you experienced, and yet I don't think you get to sit down and talk about it. No, I really don't. And his picture's in my office, and I have a letter from him that I have on a canvas that's hanging in my office, and that's That's really a big part of when you lose somebody to suicide that you don't get to share is the life that they lived or who they were as a person, for better or for worse. You don't get to talk about it a lot. Everybody wants to know about the death or they don't know what to say when they find out it's suicide. So you just, you, there's not a lot of opportunities to talk about it, you know, and it's cancer or something quote unquote more natural people are more comfortable with that kind of conversation when it doesn't have a stigma correct and there still is such a stigma which is why I wanted to talk about suicide and my own suicide loss this week for suicide prevention week it is important to talk about and it's also 
on the flip side of it, of course, I'm going to, you know, talk about my grief experience. But, you know, I think for people who struggle and they will look at those of us who have lost somebody to suicide and it's easy to see somebody who's functioning really well or is doing really well or is successful. I mean, heck, I've built a business around it. And it's easy to go to a place of, oh, everybody's fine. They Mm -hmm. eventually are fine after. And while I am okay, my life, me, everything was forever changed as a result of his death. And I really think that's an important piece to share and to let people know that you never, you never come back. You never fully come back after losing somebody that way. It's never over. It's always a part of your, it's a part of your story that is present. And I think what you're acknowledging there is that, I don't know, for people who hear or, you know, it can be like a casual, a casual hearing. Like, oh, that's a horrible thing that happened in the past and it's over. But yeah, I look at you. It's done. It's And it's not. So my dad died on December 27th, 2011. So it will be 12 years this December. The last day we saw my dad was Christmas. Yeah, thanks, Dad. Thanks for that one. <laughs> Christmas Day, 2011, obviously, was the last time we saw him. You know, it's interesting because when he left that day, we were at my sister's house in Denver. And when he left that day... I stood at the door, I very much remember this, I stood at the door and I waved to him until his car was out of sight Mm -hmm. and that was something I had not done since I was a little girl. I don't remember saying this, but my sister and my husband both told me that I turned around, started crying and said, we're never going to see him again. I honestly don't remember it. I was in such a state of shock, but there was just this weird feeling that I had really weird feeling, a premonition that we weren't going to see him again. So the next day, we, well, my sister and I, the rest of that day, we kind of talked about what we were going to do because he was struggling. He had had a really big back surgery and struggled with addiction, um, which is a part of the story I I actually don't really talk about because you've already got the stigma of suicide. Mm -hmm. So you add on the the second element of addiction and now you got to double stigma. And that part of the story I've really not talked too much about. He, when he was in high school, um, he broke his back playing football Mm -hmm. and they actually told him he would never walk again. And miraculously he did. So he had really bad scars actually under his armpits. He didn't have hair and bad scars from these, this surgery. Mm -hmm. And he at some point did get addicted way, way before I was born to pain medication. When hmm, the whole opiate crisis that the world didn't know about till recently, and I've actually known about for a very long time because it was a crisis starting in the late 90s, but he refused to have this back surgery for about a decade. Mm-hmm. He needed to have another one, and he kept refusing it because he was so terrified to go under pain medication again Mm -hmm. so when he finally did have the surgery we I mean he had to he could barely move he couldn't get out of bed you know the guy tried everything to try to get the surgeon to do it without medication and the doctor's just like I'll lose my license I I can't he had every precaution in place to not get re-addicted to pain medication everything went beautifully until he had a complication in the hospital the insurance company at the time would not continue to have him at the hospital, so they sent him to a rehabilitation center. And I remember getting that call and saying to my sister, he's going to get addicted again. I was working in a rehabilitation center in a not great area in Chicago at the time. Let's just say medication is fairly easy to come by in some facilities. So he did. He did get addicted again to pain medication. He actually told us about it. And what we didn't know, though, is he tried to cut a cold turkey, which now I've learned can be very, very horrible. Whether that was a contributing factor, I think he 
he was a recovering alcoholic. He had been sober for almost a decade. So he clearly struggled with mental health throughout his life, Mm -hmm. which is hard because you look at our labels for addiction and he was not your traditional alcoholic, but he had been sober for a really long time. And so when he cut the medication, he was very isolated. He was very anxious. I don't, I don't really know. All I know is we knew he was struggling. We didn't know how bad. Yeah. My sister and I had thought up kind of an intervention of sorts to have him come live with her and to get some help. He was seeing somebody for therapy. I have thoughts and opinions about that. That person also was prescribing a substantial amount of medication. Again, thoughts and feelings about that. I did know what he was prescribed, and I do remember telling him, you're on more medication than some of my patients with schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. This is not okay. But we were going to bring him to my sister's, and we called him that next day, the 26th, and he sounded so good. Mm. He was him. Mm -hmm. It's a hard one. Because now looking back at it, you know, we we get why he sounded good. But he sounded happy. He said he was out shopping, which he hadn't done in months because he was too anxious. And we thought, great, I'm going to fly back to Chicago tomorrow, the 27th, and let's just reevaluate. His birthday's in a week. Flew back to Chicago the evening of the 27th. And 12, 12 12.30, something like that, in in the middle of the night, my husband actually, Dan said, your phone's ringing. And I, like, looked over. It was on the floor. And Mm -hmm. I saw my sister's name. And I said, I remember I looked at my husband. I missed the call, and I had to go call her back. But I looked at Dan. I said, my dad's gone. Then I called her back and obviously found out Mm -hmm. that he had taken his life. Mm -hmm. And everything changed from there. Yeah. And it's, there's so many elements that are so hard because the number one question I get asked, don't ask people this, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I I have a different understanding and I'll explain it to why people ask, did you know? Did you know? Did you see the signs? One, please don't ask somebody that because you're already consumed with more guilt than you will ever understand unless you've gone through it guilt that consumes you and it's hard to answer because when you go back and you look at all the details yeah you do see signs Mm -hmm. and the hard part is is the brain is tricks you right it's if you watch a movie a second or third time, knowing how it ends, you see different things yep. that you didn't see the first time. So sometimes those signs that become so clear after the fact are really subtle when you're going through them. So it's a hard question to answer. That's why I hate the question is there's no, there's no right answer. Right. I've developed a different relationship with that question I do think some people are just really nosy and ask inappropriate questions that they shouldn't ask. I also, though, think that people naturally fear that it's going to happen to them Mm -hmm. and will say and ask questions from a place of curiosity on did you know in an effort to prevent it from happening to them. So while I hate that question, I also understand it, and that's why I talk about my story and tell my story about signs being there, but how subtle they were, because I don't want, I would love for suicide to not be a thing. Mm -hmm. Sadly, it continues to increase post-pandemic. I don't want others to go through that. I don't want people to be in that much pain that they think that's the only option. Mm -hmm. You know, again, with that, did you know, you know, when I waved goodbye to my dad, did I know? Like, yeah, something was telling me something was off. Right. But you don't ever think, right? It's kind of car accidents. 
You know mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a possibility. Right. But do you think it's ever going to happen? That's the hard part. You don't ever truly believe it's going to happen until it, it does. Right. And it's still shock. There are still times, even 12 years later, I will look at my husband and be like, did that happen? Yeah, it's still shocking. Not every premonition that we have, if you had that sense that not, not every premonition that we have comes true, not every weird feeling results in something. And you handle this question with so much grace. Like, I, I think it's, I just want to applaud you for how you're discussing it here. That question makes it seem like somehow, like it's hard not to have that question asked without then feeling like it's somehow your fault. Well, and the big part is because you you think it is. That's such a hard part. And with every single person that I have walked alongside in their grief, I've yet to meet somebody that doesn't carry guilt. Right. And I've even had people say, but you were the child. He was the parent. It doesn't matter. Mm-mm. When you lose somebody in such a traumatic way, it is hard one, it doesn't make sense. The brain can't conceptualize it. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't make sense. And we ha- we seek to find meaning, right? Why? Why did this happen? And our brain works to build a narrative, and we're always part of that narrative. Could I have changed the outcome? And another, you know, hard piece, which is more in my clinical practice and what I've told therapists is what makes me actually a little 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 crazy is when people tell people there's nothing you could have done it's not your fault mm. one no it's not your fault but is there things i could have done yes but i don't know that it would have changed the outcome yeah that's what i am very firm in working with people and myself included that I have to remind myself 100% there's stuff I could have done differently. And in fact, knowing that gives me a little bit of control in a very out of control situation. If I look at what I could have done differently, it helps me feel like should this come up again in my life, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. Mm Mm-hmm. But I don't know that it would have changed the outcome. Yes. You know, made him stay that day, sure. Could we have, you know, taken him somewhere that day? Sure. Do I know that that would have prevented it from happening? No. So you learn to live with an incomplete puzzle. It's like you have a thousand pieces, right? And you put this whole puzzle, you spend hours putting this puzzle together, and then you can't find a couple of the pieces. Mm -hmm. And you have to not only be okay with it, you have to frame it and put it like on your wall and look at it every day. Mm -hmm. And that's why you never, you never get over it. You get through it. And I really, truly, truly do love the person I've become today. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that I work through in my grief journey and continue to work through that have made me a lot better of a person. But it really sucks that it had to come with that kind of pain. Mm -hmm. You're obviously, you're 12 years in now, about 12 years. I wonder what grief was like for you at different points along the way it's continuous right Mm -hmm. it was really ugly after I was not a mom yet I was newly married you know I struggled really bad in that first year after my dad died I had just graduated from grad school when he died Mm. you want to talk about questioning your ability to do a new profession I couldn't even help my dad. How the hell do you think I can help anybody else? It was very, very hard. I questioned everything. Mm -hmm. I was just looking for a reason for the pain. And what could make the pain go away? Mm -hmm. Then I wouldn't hurt so bad. Mm -hmm. With this type of grief, you're introduced to a level of pain. You just never knew. And then you got to sit in it for a really long time. And you have to, like, get comfortable with it, Mm -hmm. which isn't easy. 
which is why when people say, I don't know how you do what you do, I'm like, oh, sometimes the most comfortable thing is sitting with other people in their pain because then they're not alone. And I sat alone for a long time. But with every life event comes the pain. So I was just tell people it's like a really bad, if you've ever had a really bad injury, Mm -hmm. I broke my femur in a really bad car accident when I was 16. And, you know, whenever the weather changes, Mm -hmm. oh, it aches so bad Yeah, for a day or two. And then it stops. That's what the grief is like. You know, when my kids were born or when I hadn't, when I had my son, because my dad wanted a boy so bad. Last year when my son played his first season of baseball and we got his team and it was the Baltimore Orioles, which was my dad's most favorite team in this world across all sports. And it was so awesome and hard at the same time to look at this little guy in this Orioles outfit and thought, oh my God, he would be so proud and happy. So then you spend a couple days in that pain and then it passes, but it just never goes away. You know, when I said I wanted to do this episode, it was really to bring awareness. Mm -hmm. And that's truly the point is to bring awareness to the impact of suicide Mm -hmm. and the struggles that people who lose somebody to suicide go through. Mm -hmm. It's a lot different to talk from it, like we said before, than to talk about it. This is not a graphic to be shared on social media. It is not a checklist. It's your heart. It's your life. It's your story. And it's something that you work so hard and you hope so hard that no one ever has to go through. But we know that there are people listening who have gone through this. We know that there are people listening who will go through this kind of loss and who will know that they're not alone in that. Absolutely. You never realize how many people who have experienced this type of loss till you go through it. And again, it's just you don't talk about it. But as soon as somebody does, you have other arms go up in the room and people saying, oh my gosh, me too. I went through that experience. Is it ever hard to talk about? I know it's like a weird question to ask now that you've been sharing for a little bit, but you know, we talk about how this loss is particular in that it it does have a stigma associated with it. It is something that people feel like sometimes they can't share or speak out loud and you have to hold it until somebody else says, somebody else that you like and admire and you know says, I went through that. It's so awkward. Jess knows how to shut a room up so quickly. <laughs> It's the sad humor, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's, you want to shut a room up, tell them you lost your dad to suicide. Mm-hmm. Silence, which sucks. It's so awkward. Mm-hmm. And it takes everything not to be like, why are you being awkward? Like, mm-hmm. I'm the one who went through it. You can't talk. There's very few times and people I can actually talk about him with mm-hmm. because people get so awkward, right? Yeah. If I'm like, oh my gosh, my dad would have loved that. And People will just, it's like deer in headlights. But people get really, really awkward. The really hard part post-loss is when you're kind of right in in the mesh of it. When you tell somebody you lost somebody to suicide, you immediately, nine out of ten times, end up comforting the other person. I honestly, what, what led me to being pretty depressed after my dad was not being able to talk about it Mm -hmm. because every single time I did, I had to comfort the other person. And then you have to defend the person, which you don't have to do with other losses. Oh, but he was a really great guy and good and loving and nurturing. You have to then defend their honor, which is why I never even really talked about the addiction component to it because I had enough stigma with the suicide component. Now I'm starting to talk about it more because addiction is so prevalent now and it accompanies suicide often because it's mental health related, right? Right, right. Change of the brain. Exactly. And that's what it is, is it's just nobody knows what to say. 
I am always the call in my personal life. You know, if somebody loses, when a friend of a friend loses somebody tragically, right? I get the call of how can I support them? How can I, you know, what can I do? And I give the same response each time. Call them in six months. Show up in six months. Everybody shows up right after. Show up in six months when reality actually sets in and they realize what happened because shock Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful thing after a traumatic loss. Mm -hmm. Tricks you into thinking you're doing a lot better than you are. Mm -hmm. So by the time everybody moves on with their life is right when that chalk wears off and you're in this holy shit moment, this actually happened and Mm -hmm. everybody's moved on. I always say show up in six months and it's not about what you say as much as just being there. You're not going to be able to fix it. Mm -mm. Nobody in this world can fix somebody else's pain. Nobody. Therapists can't. But what works is having somebody sit with you in it. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to do, guys. We do this for a profession, but I, doing this here with my friend for the last little bit here, it's hard to do. It's very painful. You want to make it better. You don't want to cry or whatever, but it's okay if you do. It's okay. You don't have to say anything. Probably you shouldn't. Bit my tongue quite a lot. There wasn't anything I needed to say. Mm -mm. I'm also hearing you say you need to let your person know they can talk about not just the death, but the life with the person. Forever and ever. Yeah, forever and ever. Forever. And that may be happy memories. It may be mad, sad, angry, you know. That person is still a part of a survivor's life. And so I'm wondering, what would you tell me about your dad? Mm. My kids know this too. My dad gave the best hugs, which I, in my practice, I hug everybody. If I don't, I have people say, where's my hug? I'm like, oh my gosh, here you, you know, and I, I'm, I'm a big hugger. And my daughter will always say, mom, you give the best hugs. I bet you give hugs like grandpa did. Like mm. that's the goal because he was something, he just, honestly, his hugs are what I miss the most. Mm-hmm. He was super kind, gentle soul. Mm. He was very nurturing. Mm-hmm. Let me get away with way too much. <laughs> he was the least judgmental person I've ever met. Mm -hmm. He had a story that a lot of us didn't know, and he always understood that with people, that everybody just has a story. They're just doing their best. He loved rock and roll. (laughs) Oh, God. He used to have these CD collections. Oh, my gosh. I'm like, Dad, we would listen to music all the time. He was such a music guy. He was total hippie. (laughs) Total hippie. He like had a peace sign still up in his office. I'm like, you are just, I mean, he, you know, Woodstock loving, like hitchhiked to Florida. Stop. Oh, oh yeah. Total free spirit. And he was always the person I called when I messed up and said, oh, I did something stupid again. And he would never judge, never shame, but he would make sure you learned from it. Mm -hmm. I will say bailed me out one too many times with some things. (laughs) Had to kind of learn the hard way eventually, but he's the one that I I like miss being able to call and be like, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. Or anytime I was going through something hard, like he was always the one to be like, it's going to be fine. He was a character. There was, there's not too many people like him. He was imperfect, and he had his faults, but he was just a good dude. Yeah. I don't know that there's really a person that can say he did anything bad or mean. Mm. And he was your dad. And he was my dad. But it is good to be able to talk about him. It's an honor to be able to hear about him. I wish I could have met him. He was pretty fun. Yeah. <laughs> he was a hoot. We would have had a good time. Thank you for sharing him with me. I hope today's conversation helps encourage honest conversation. We never know what a person is going through unless we ask, listen to understand, speak to be understood, 
Know that someone might look perfectly fine on the outside, but be struggling with something beyond belief on the inside. Do not minimize. Do not advise. Do not say, this too shall pass. Know when to ask for help. And don't stop asking until you feel heard. And please remember, this world needs you and people aren't better off without you. Suicide is a topic that hides in the shadows and all too often goes unaddressed. Talking is the first step to preventing suicide. You can make a difference by learning the warning signs, knowing the risk factors, and bravely having a real, open, and honest conversation with someone that you care about. You can find links to risk factors, protective factors, and warning signs, along with conversation starters in our show notes. If you or anyone you know is in a crisis or has considered taking your own life, please know that help is available. You can call or text 988 or text TALK to 741741. A live, trained crisis counselor is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Please know that there is always another option.